All right, you ready to get in the Word? Word. Grab a Bible, let's go to the Scriptures. Turn with me in your Bible to John chapter 4. If you would stand with me for the reading of the Word tonight. And if you're new here, you're wondering why we're standing. We just believe that this book, this life, this Jesus uh, deserves a response from us. When certain things in life come, there's a lot of things that we can sit down for. But one thing we should always stand up for is what this book tells us. When we come together and we stand, we're acknowledging that this life, this, this Christianity, this following Jesus, so much bigger than ourselves. So turn with me in your Bible to John chapter 4. Uh, we're going to begin in verse number 23 tonight. And uh, really excited to continue our series on Closer, talking about the Holy Spirit. We're going to talk about worship tonight. It's going to be great. Verse number 23, it says, But the hour is coming, and now is, when the true worshipers will worship the Father in spirit and truth, for the Father is seeking. Everyone say seeking. seeking. Turn to your neighbor say, he's looking for you. For the Father is seeking such to worship him. God is spirit, and those who worship him must worship in spirit and in truth. I want to speak to you a message entitled, What God Really Wants in Our Worship. What God Really Wants in Our Worship. Let's pray. Lord, thank you that your presence is here, that something shifted during worship, something happened in our hearts, that we no longer desire what we want, but we want to know what you want. We pray that the way we walked into this building wouldn't be the same that we would walk out. God, we pray that you would transform our very lives tonight according to your will. We just want to leave seeing Jesus a little bit better and a little bit brighter. So we thank you in Jesus' name. And all God's people said, amen. Amen. You can be seated on your way down. Say, "He's, he's looking for you. He's looking for you. Ladies and gentlemen, when we look at our text this evening, we have a dialogue going on between Jesus and this woman of Samaria. If you're familiar with the story, this conversation is taking place in the middle of the daytime. This woman has gone to the well to draw water, most likely for her and her family. And as she is there getting ready to draw water, she runs into this man and they begin to talk and they have this discussion. It's a beautiful picture of what our lives are like when we come and meet Jesus because she's going to the well because she needs water. She's going to the well because she's in a place of thirst. Did you know that every day your spirit is thirsting for something more? Did you know that every day you are faced with becoming content with what's happened, but yet also wanting to pursue what can happen? And it's this oxymoron that we as believers are filled with God's spirit, but yet we're always hungry for more. This woman is at this well, and as she's talking, Jesus gives her this statement that just blows my mind. He says, God is seeking worshipers. Now, I don't know if you're like me, but there are times where I'm looking for something and I can just not, I can't find it. Uh, Car keys, phones, anybody ever lost their phone before? That just tells you how messed up technology is. It's like we lose our lives if we lose our phones. (laughs) Better yet, I would say that God is not seeking just something, but it's almost as if God has this craving and he's willing to do whatever it takes to fulfill that craving. Have you ever had a craving before? I tell you, one of the craziest craziness I get all the time is uh, uh, Chick-fil-A. Now, if you have not noticed yet, there is no Chick-fil-A in the desert yet, but there comes times in my day where I just say, man, I could just go for some Chick-fil-A. The spirit of Chick-fil-A comes upon me, and I begin to see chickens, and I begin to smell chickens, and I just desire chickens. Most of the times, I'll just jump in the car and just drive down the highway just to fulfill that craving. What about like donuts? Have you ever craved donuts before? Krispy Kreme donuts. You know, Winchell's is cool, all that stuff's cool, but I'm talking about like when you get a Krispy Kreme craving, something, you're just, you're willing to do whatever it takes to fulfill that craving. Now, it's not that you need the donuts, but you crave them. I want you to catch this. It's not that God needs worshipers because he is self-sufficient, he is self-sustaining. If you and I weren't even here, he would still be good. If we never said a word, I love you, God, he would still be good. That's how great and awesome he is. But he is almost desiring this worship from us. And when he receives worship, he responds. The Bible says that God inhabits the praises of his people, that when you and I recognize who he is, he shows up in our midst. Ain't that powerful? There's so many other religions out there that pray to God and nothing happens. But you and I, when we pray, when we worship, we see a response from him. I love when I talk to people about church and they say, I don't go to that church because I I don't like the worship. I don't like the music. And I say, that's funny because the worship is never designed to get you here. 
The worship is designed to get God here. You see, it's not how we worship, it's who we worship. It's not what we're just saying, it's who we're saying it to. And we must understand that tonight, that if we show up, that's great, and we don't like the music, we don't come back. As bad as it sounds, it's okay if you don't come back. We need one person to come back, and his name is Jesus. We need to make sure Jesus is here, because if he doesn't come back, no one will get healed. If he doesn't come back, no one will get breakthrough. So we need to make sure he shows up. That is why we worship, to, to get him here. It is the response he's looking for. And if you do not have a perception of the things of God, if you have not been introduced to this Holy Spirit, if you don't have a relationship with him, you will never understand why we worship. Look what the Bible says in uh, 1 Corinthians chapter number 2. Paul says this. He says, the person without the Spirit does not accept the things of the Spirit that come from the Spirit, but considers them foolishness and cannot understand them because they are discerned only through the Spirit. So Paul says you will never understand worship until you first have the Spirit. The Spirit is the lens that allows you to see why you're doing what you're doing. Okay, without the Spirit, you're just listening to music. Without the Spirit, you're just talking. You're not praying, you're just saying stuff. So we must understand that we need the Holy Spirit to properly understand why we're worshiping and also who we're worshiping. Many of us here tonight may not even have an understanding of what worship is. We think that worship is just the part of our service where we sing, but I want to tell you it's a lot deeper than that. Worship is not just something we do outwardly. A lot of times it's coming from within us, okay? The, The word worship, it actually can mean this, to ascribe the highest worth or value to something or someone. Worship is to place the highest value on something or someone. (laughs) So many of us are worshiping, but we just don't realize what we're worshiping. Okay, I love my wife. My wife is incredible. I'd never be the same if it wasn't for her. But she does not have the highest value of my heart because there is only one person that is the highest, and that is God. And through my worship to him, I'm able to properly love my wife. Okay? Your job is great. I thank God that he's given you a job, that he's blessed you, but don't begin to place the highest value on your job before you place it on your God. Don't place value on your stuff until you place it on your Savior. Don't place value on material things that will fade away and that don't even matter before you place value on the one that gave it to you in the first place. This is, this is worship. This is what you and I have been designed to do. I will go as far as and say this, that worship is the only reason that you and I even exist. And for many, it's hard to perceive that because we, again, we think that worship is just singing songs. Worship goes a lot deeper than that. It's, it's something more. You know, I, I recently, uh, about three weeks ago, I just turned 26, and every time that you turn a certain age, there are certain things that you have to do to make sure, like, all your documents in order. You have to update information on certain websites, make sure, you know, your Social Security is good. But one of the things that you have to do every so year is renew your driver's license. Now, how many right now can admit that you do not like your driver's license photo? What's crazy about the driver's license photo is literally you have one shot to take this photo and you must wait a number of years before you get another chance to take a photo. (laughs) Am I the only one be pulling out your license, making up stories? Why you, uh, I just want to let you know, officer, this is a long time ago. (laughs) Friends be like, let me see your driver's license. I just want to tell you, this is a long time ago. This is before this. So I I, I made an appointment to get my driver's license photo retaken. And uh, I was telling Randy, my wife, I was like, man, I'm just really nervous about taking this photo. And she's like, why? And I was just like, man, that's like, I only have one shot to get this thing right. And then I must wait like five or six more years till I take another one. I said, this is a lot of pressure. And so I told her, I said, I'm gonna get ready for it. So I went and got my hair cut. You know what I mean? Went and make sure that my shirt was clean. Get inside the DMV. I'm all excited. I'm ready. I'm gonna nail this. Now, I, 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 I could preach a whole sermon about the DMV. First of all, I just, <laughs> it doesn't matter how much you love Jesus. You walk in that place and you, you better make sure you're ready. Okay, and so I walk into the DMV, I go to the left, I'm standing in the line to talk to the lady about my appointment, and as soon as I walk in, I see the photographer's area over there on the right. You see the blue background, and there's a line waiting, and I'm like, there it is. I'm going to nail this photo, right? Every so now and then, the lady, next, 
take a step forward, and then, you know, there's, there's one lady that walks up. She gets in front of the thing. You hear the guy count down, three, two, one. Say cheese, cheese. You know, I'm looking. I'm like, okay, hers is pretty good. You know, next, I'm, I'm swiping up. And eventually, I find myself, get my appointment number, sit in line, now calling G, 52, whatever. Walk around, and now I'm in line to take my photo. And my heart is beating. I'm in this line, and I'm, I'm you know, I, I'm sitting there in line, and I'm, I'm like, wow, I haven't even practiced my smile yet. Like, do I smile with my teeth? Do I smile just, you know, mouth closed? What am I going to do? Eventually, I get up to the line, and, and the guy that was working behind the counter, um, let's just say God really loves him, man. He is awesome. And, um, you know, he just, uh, step up. And I'm like, give him my stuff. And he goes, take three steps back, stand on the yellow line. And I'm, <laughs> boom, boom, I'm getting nervous, right? And then he does the countdown. He goes, smile if you want. Three, two, one. And my wife, she was like, you know, you can ask them to see your photo. And once I met this guy, I wasn't trying to him, ask him nothing. Okay, he was just like, you know, I walk up. He's like, you'll get it in three to four weeks. And it still hasn't come. So I'm still on edge. Like, what's it going to look like? What's it going to look like? Right? I'm nervous. And, and as I was prepping for this message, the Lord reminded me of that, that, that experience. Because it was almost as if this one moment mattered so much because I knew I only had one chance. And I wonder how differently we would approach worship if we thought it was the only chance we had. I wonder how much time and effort we would actually put into coming before God if we knew it was our last chance. What if the Lord comes back tonight and we all go to heaven? What if that last chance you had to worship was tonight? What would you do differently? How would you approach God if you knew you only had one chance? See, I believe that God is not looking for us to seem like we have it all together when we come to worship. The Bible does not deal with who we pretend to be. It deals with who we actually are. And tonight, as Jesus is addressing this woman, he gives her two things that he wants, that God says he's he's looking for people to worship in, in spirit and in truth. So the question I ask you tonight is, what do you think God really wants in our worship? Number one, the first thing I believe he wants is accuracy, which is the spirit. He wants us to know where our worship is going. He wants us to know who it is directed towards. He wants us to know that worship is not just something we sing so people know we can sing. Worship is not just something we do. Worship must become something that we are. Instruments may be played on the stage, but you and I are instruments of worship. We have been designed to give glory and honor to our Father, to the one that created us. Okay? I love the book of Psalms when it comes to this kind of idea because David was so clear on where his worship went. The Bible says in, in Psalm chapter uh, 142, it says, I pour out my complaint before who? Him. So David never actually went and complained to people until he first complained to God. And even the idea of complaining to God, it doesn't seem right, does it? We're like, why would I complain to God? I believe God would rather have you complain to him before you complain to your boss. I believe you can share concerns with man, but complaints must be first checked with God. I believe he is the ultimate complaint department. He's the ultimate complaint hotline. Before you open your mouth and tell everyone what's going wrong, first check with God and say, I'm complaining. This is what's going wrong with me. Like, can I tell you what my prayer, what my prayer life's been like the last couple of weeks? I used to think prayer was, you know, wake up early in the morning and go before God and start thinking about everything you want to say before you even talk to him. Father, I just thank you that you have woken me up this morning in your glory and the birds are chirping. You start making up words <laughs> magnanimously and I just thank you for the intricacy and you start making up stuff that doesn't even make sense. And eventually God's like, what, what are you saying? <laughs> well, God, I thought this is what you want me to pray. God's like, no, I want you to pray what's on your heart. No, but what's on my heart, God, is not as important as what's on your heart. So I want to pray what's on your heart. So what's on your heart? And God, God's kind of like, well, what's on my heart is what's on your heart. So why don't you just pray what's on your heart? And you're like, no, God, I want to pray what's on your heart, not my heart, your heart. And God's like, man, I'm just confused now. <laughs> I open myself up for you to pour yourself out, and still you're withholding something. See, see worship cannot involve your will. You cannot actually worship God and still be thinking about yourself. So this is my prayer a couple weeks ago. We're having a youth meeting, all sitting around, talking about our big event coming up in June. We're all talking, and all of a sudden, these two people start kind of going back and forth about a few things. Eventually, they're actually like kind of like bickering. 
and this is, this is the exact prayer I prayed. I said, Jesus, if you don't come down here, I'm about to go off on these little high schoolers right now. <laughs> and seriously, the spirit of peace came on me in that moment. Because I believe it's not until we tell God who we really are that he responds with who he really is. Watch, let's continue in, in uh, Psalms chapter 142. If you could go back to that, please. In verse 3 now, David says, when my spirit was overwhelmed within me, then you knew my path. Almost to say as God didn't respond with what was next until I actually told him who I actually was. The psalm is a beautiful place to study worship because David is telling God, I'm messed up about this. I'm confused about that. I'm I'm really jealous and I'm really insecure about this, but I'm confident about this. And once David spends time talking about who he is, you always see it in his psalms. There's always a shift where he goes, but this is who you are. He goes, I am messed up. I am broken. I am insecure, but God, you are faithful. I am lonely. I, I am helpless, but you are a father to the fatherless. And it's not until he worships through his own imperfection that he actually sees the glory and the beauty of who God is. This is what we must do when we worship. We we must just be so brutally honest before God and come in and say, man, God, I am frustrated today. Man, God, I am lonely today, but I need to be reminded of who you are. See, you can't tell God who he is without him telling you who you are. So when I say father, he has to say son. When I say I'm sick, he has to say healer. When I say I'm broke, he has to say provider. It's his nature to respond to who he is. When you acknowledge who he is, he will reaffirm who you are. That is the beauty that worship does to us. It's the amazing thing that at times I can't understand, but it's so necessary for my life. Worship is not just a suggestion for the believer. It is a necessity for the believer. We need to worship to truly understand who we are. Can you imagine what the most beautiful picture of worship was when it comes to scripture? I believe in the beginning of the beginning of the beginning, we see God create the heavens and the earth and he creates man from the dust of the ground, pulls woman out the rib of man and now you have man and woman in the very presence of God. They were walking around in the garden of Eden and they were in the perfect communion with God. I mean, this was like legit. No drama, no stuff going wrong. It was just nothing but them and God. It was just this perfect worship. Can you imagine Adam being out working late and all of a sudden he comes home and, 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 and uh, Eve is kind of like, what took you so long? Adam, I'm getting lonely. Adam would be like, what's loneliness? Adam is getting mad at Eve. I, you've been spending too much time with that monkey over there. I'm starting to get jealous. <laughs> I'm getting jealous, Adam. Adam. What is jealousy? What is bitterness? What is rage? What is anger? They didn't know that stuff because when you're in God's presence, man's attributes can't exist. When you are in God's presence, man's problems have no hold on you. When you're in God's presence, what seemed big now seems small. When you worship truly from your spirit, what you were worried about doesn't even have a hold on you anymore. That's how good his presence is. And so we see man and woman walking with God in the very cool of the day. And then something happens. Someone say something happens. Look what the Bible says in Genesis chapter 3, starting in verse 6. So when the woman saw that the tree was good. Someone say, "Uh uh-oh. Can't hear you. Say, "Uh uh-oh. When the woman saw that the tree was good for food, that it was pleasant to the eyes, and a tree desirable to make one wise, she took of its fruit and ate. She also gave to her husband with her, and he ate. Verse 7. Then the eyes of both of them were opened, and they knew they were naked. And they sewed fig leaves together and made themselves covering. The first time that man realized he was missing something is when he looked at himself instead of God. It wasn't until Eve looked at herself and said, wow, we're naked, that all of a sudden that perfect worship they were brought out of. See, as I said earlier, you cannot worship and still think about yourself. What happens is Eve gets her eyes off of God and puts it on something that she wants. And rather than acknowledging what she needs, She becomes enticed and enamored by what she wants. Am I the only one that's ever been there? There are times that I just want stuff. Like stuff, like stupid stuff. Stuff that's not even going to last. And any time I am tempted to take my eyes off Jesus and put it on stuff, I am now pulled out of that harmony and that communion with God. 
So it is possible that you can be worshiping God and get distracted. It is possible that the accuracy of your worship can go towards stuff instead of your Savior. It's possible that you think salvation can be about what you do and what you have rather than believing in what was done for you. And this has kind of been the motto that's been in my heart for the last several months is I don't go to heaven for what I do. I go to heaven for believing in what Jesus did for me. I go to heaven because I worshiped what he did, not what I do. And sadly, I believe we have many Christians today that are worshiping their own works rather than Jesus's. So it's accuracy. Someone say accuracy. accuracy. The second thing that I believe God is looking for is authenticity. This is the truth that he's talking about. So he's saying, I want you to worship in spirit, accuracy. I want you to worship in truth, authenticity. Like, God wants you to be real. Don't be lying. Tell your neighbor, say, why are you always lying? Some of you get that. God wants us to be true and authentic before him. Again, David comes to my mind. David is like, God, if you don't come down here, I I'm going to kill somebody. God says, okay, I'm, I'm going to show up. And we see in this dialogue back in the, the story that we opened with between Jesus and this woman, Jesus shows up at this well, and he says, can I have some water? And this woman's like, why are you asking me, a Samaritan, to give you a Jew water? And he says, woman, if you knew who was asking you, you would tell them to give you water. And then she goes, you ain't got nothing to draw with, though. Like, I have this bucket. You don't have anything. And again, Jesus is like, ah, okay, you know, let's just talk about something else then. She's, you know, I have living water. I can make your life better. And then she responds with this. She says, well, sir, give me this living water all the time. Now, if you read the Bible like that, you would miss something pretty significant here. See, when I read the Bible, I enjoy getting into the story and actually sitting there with the characters that are going on. So Jesus says, I got living water. And she says, sir, give me this living water all the time. See, I think this girl has some ghetto to her. I don't think this was serious. I, th I think there was some sarcasm here. I think she was like, give me this water all the time then if you got it. <laughs> Seriously, because she doesn't, there's not a shift until a few verses later. So it's almost as if she's like, give it to me if you got it then. And, and the Lord showed me something at this. Did you know that your spirit has a tone to it? Did you know that God's timing can sometimes be dictated by your tone? As for me and my house, we'll serve the Lord. And God's like, okay, keep talking like that. I just believe God's going to supply my needs, and that's the tone of your spirit. Come on, I'm broke, pastor. Well, God's going to supply your needs. Yeah, I know that, but still. I was talking to somebody a few weeks ago, and they were telling me about their marriage. They said, and then it's going on. My marriage is going on. This was going wrong. And I'm like, hey, is Jesus at the center of your marriage? And they're like, yeah, we got the whole Jesus thing down. But, you know, I'm still doing this. I'm still doing that. And I'm like, well, wait a second. Wait a second. Let's back it up. Because if Jesus is at the center, then nothing else can come in between that. I don't know why this. I was talking to a young person. I don't know why this is going wrong. I, you know, and I said, what's the Bible say? Romans 8. They say, well, yeah, God causes all things to work together for the good. But I'm still trying to figure it out. And I'm like, no, no, let's back it up here. Because do you believe that he works it for the good? If your tone is right, God will show up. If you believe what you say, it will happen. And this is what worship must be. We can worship because we think we believe, or we can worship because we know we believe. See, some worship because they believe, others worship until they believe. I want to be someone that just worships until I understand. I want to worship until I get it. I want to worship until it makes sense. Did you know your worship has a tone to it? So Jesus is kind of like, girl, if you only knew who was standing before you. This is what he says. Verse 16, Jesus said to her, go call your husband. I'm tired of dealing with you. Go get your husband. <laughs> Tell him to come here. And the woman answered and said, I have no husband. And Jesus said, uh, yeah, you're right. You have no husband. Matter of fact, you have had five husbands, and the one whom you are with now is not your husband. In that, you spoke truly. Now this woman is like, dang. Okay, I got, you got my attention now, Jesus. She goes, I, I think you're a prophet. What Jesus is saying, he's saying, I'm going to show you that you're a worshiper. But you've been worshiping the wrong things. You've been looking for this fulfillment, you've been looking for this joy, but you're looking in men rather than in me. You're looking for love, joy, peace in all the wrong places. Have you ever looked for love in the wrong place? 
Have you? I mean, it's, it's a scary place to be. When you give your heart to something that can't handle your heart. Your heart is too big to be putting it into somebody so small. Your heart is too big to be putting it into a job that doesn't respect and honor you. That's the kind of God we serve. He's got a big plan for us. So why is our thinking so small? You still with me? Timothy Keller said this. He said, whatever captures the heart also controls the feelings and behavior. Almost as to let us know wherever we put our heart can dictate how we feel. And what happens is you give your heart to things that cannot hold your heart. And then when that relationship, that job, that, that, that car, whatever it is, when it drops your heart, what happens? Your heart becomes broken. And this is where we've developed this term, I'm heartbroken, because I put my heart into something that cannot hold it. This is why we're very reluctant to put our heart into the things of God, because we compare God with man. And we think, well, my real dad left me, so why would I trust a heavenly dad? Well, you know, why would I trust Jesus? I don't have brothers that are there for me. How can this big brother that is Jesus be there for me? When the Bible, can I tell you what the Bible says? The Bible says in Isaiah that God has engraved your names on the palms of his hand. I preached this message once in, in, uh, in uh, youth ministry. It was called God Has Tattoos. I said, tell all your friends that next week your youth pastor is going to preach about God has tattoos. And I remember running it by rabbi. He was like, I don't think you should say that. I don't know about that one. <laughs> and I was like, no, let's go. To, you know, and I showed him. I was, and, and, and what's amazing is that God says, I love you so much that I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to inscribe, I'm going to engrave, I'm going to tattoo your name on my hand. Now, I have tattoos, and never once have I lifted up my arms and seen a tattoo fall off. <laughs> so why are you so worried that God's going to drop you? How can you be worried that God can't handle you? How can we worship from this idea of, I'm not really sure, I'm not really sure, because what if he messes up? God can't mess up. He already put everything together. <laughs> Nothing surprises him. Nothing catches him off guard. Of course, we go through trials and tragedies and we question, but it's those times that God reaffirms us this is part of the plan the whole time. Many people have a hard time worshiping a God that allows tragedy. One of the most delicate questions we as believers deal with is if God loves me so much, why does he allow suffering? And I can stand on this platform today and tell you, I don't know. But I know that he gives me a resource for it. I know that he might not provide a resolution for suffering, but he does give me a resource for it, and his name is Jesus. I know that when I go through the valley of the shadow of death, I can try to analyze and understand what's going on, or I can just worship the one that's going to be with me. He doesn't guarantee that the ride will be safe, but he does guarantee the landing will be. He tells us he's going to get us through it. Do I have anybody tonight that still believes God is working it together for the good? This is worshiping in truth. Jesus said that God's looking for people to worship in spirit and in truth. From within us, we worship towards God, and then we must deal with the filter of truth and realize it's only when I worship in truth, this is what's going wrong, this is how I feel, this is what's messed up about me, that real worship takes place. My last verse for you tonight, and, and, and this is where we'll kind of wrap it up, is found in Luke 23, and I'm going to ask them not to put it up yet. I want to kind of give you an idea of what's going on. Jesus has been arrested in the Garden of Gethsemane. He has gone before Pontius Pilate. He is now being tried for all these blasphemies about calling himself the Son of God. He's been whipped 39 times. People have spat on him. He has carried his own cross up this mountain called Golgotha. They've nailed him to this cross, him and two other men, and he is now hanging on the cross doing what he came to do. And there are two men on both sides of him that are also being crucified. And something takes place up on this cross. Something always happens on the cross. There's so many crosses that we're gonna deal with in our life. And like Jesus up on the cross, it's only then that we really understand what worship is. This is the dialogue that takes place in verse 39 as I close. Then one of the criminals who were hanged blasphemed him, saying, if you are the Christ, save yourself and us. So one man on this side of Jesus starts saying, if you're really who you say you are, why don't you save us? 
and save yourself. It continues and says, but the other, someone say the other. other. Can't hear you say the other. The other other answering him rebuked him, saying, do you not even fear God, seeing that you under the same condemnation? And we indeed justly for receive the due reward of our deeds. But this man has done nothing wrong. He starts yelling across Jesus to the other man, says, what's the matter with you? We deserve this. He hasn't done anything. And I thought, what audacity, as you are dying, to stand up for something. As I was prepping for this message, I asked the Lord, I said, where did that question come from? If I'm watching this this back and forth up on these three crosses, I would want to know, where did that man come up with that question? What's the matter with you? Don't you know this is the Son of God? And the Lord says, son, that came from his spirit. Because sometimes there are things that come from your spirit that you can't explain. Sometimes there, are, there are, are crosses you may be on and you have this word and people are like, what? So this man is on the cross. He says, what's wrong with you? It comes from his spirit. Continues on in verse 42. I love this. Now he looks to Jesus. And then he said to Jesus, I need you to catch this. If you don't get anything tonight, I want you to see this. He said to Jesus, Lord. He didn't say, sir. He didn't say, man. He didn't say Jesus, he called him Lord, which is the truth of who he actually is. So we have a man on the cross next to Jesus worshiping in spirit and in truth. On a cross, he can worship. So why is it so hard in a church for us to? As he is dying, he's able to worship. So why can't we worship when we're living? It's almost to show us that this man dying is a metaphor that we cannot truly worship him until we die to ourselves. It's almost to show us that true worship does not take place until we get rid of what we want and focus our eyes on what he wants. The verse continues in verse 42. He says, Lord, remember me when you come into your kingdom. Jesus said to him, assuredly, I say to you, today you will be with me in, can't hear you, in where? In paradise. Now, the preacher in me asked the question, why why didn't he say, you'll be with me in heaven? Why didn't he say, you'll be with me with the Father today? Why, Why did he use the word paradise? When you look at the Hebrew word for Eden, Garden of Eden, it can be translated a couple different ways, but one of the ways that it's translated is paradise. That Adam and Eve, before sin entered, they were in paradise with God. It was perfect worship. Jesus is not saying you're just going to heaven. Jesus is saying you are going back to the place that Adam was at. He's saying you are going back to the perfect worship that Adam and Eve had. This is what every time you and I worship, whether it's in a church, whether it's in our car, whether it's walking down the street, anytime we worship, what we're trying to do is get a glimpse of what Adam and Eve once had. Perfect harmony with God, perfect communion with God. Because of Jesus, what he did for you and I, we have that access. The Bible says after Adam and Eve sinned that they ran and they went and hid behind a tree. Now they are hiding from God because of what they've done wrong. It's no coincidence that the cross that Jesus hung on was made out of wood and that the tree that Adam hid behind, Jesus would hang on to basically say there is nothing you can hide from anymore. I've already paid the price for you. Friends, this has taken place in my heart maybe in the last two months or so. I've realized that preaching What we do in church and what we do when we tell others about God, it's not about us. I've had this conviction in my heart. I've shared it with Pastor Obed. I've said, Pastor, I don't want to preach another message if it simply has to do with what I can do. I don't want to preach a message that has cute rhyming points. I don't want to preach a bunch of one-liners that people tweet and say that was awesome. I don't ever want to stand before people unless I'm sharing what Jesus has done for me. I don't want to share with people about what I think. I want to share with people that what took place in Genesis 3 was saved by a God that was sent in John 3. For God so loved the world, he sent his only son. So John 3 is what redeemed Genesis 3. 
I want to share the gospel of Jesus. Because when we see Jesus on this cross, we don't just see a sacrifice. We don't just see redemption. We don't just see something that we've traditionalized in Father, Son, Holy Spirit, and it's just what we do. What we see is worship. What we see is a man, just like you and I, putting aside his own will to do the will of God. We see a man that even a few hours earlier in the garden said, God, if it's your will, let me get out of this. But not my will, but your will. We see worship. As I wrap it up, I submit to you that the greatest display of worship doesn't take place in a church. The greatest display of worship doesn't involve drums and singing and songs. The greatest display of worship involves two things, a man and a cross. The greatest display of worship was not what we can do, but it's what he's already done. And I will tell you that worship is not just about receiving good things from Jesus, but it's about recognizing and realizing what Jesus has already done. With your eyes closed in this moment, I want to ask you this question. Do you really worship? Do you really worship God for who he is? Or are you just singing for something that he can do? Tonight, maybe you say, something has shifted in my heart. I see this Jesus differently, more different than I've ever seen before. And if you're here tonight and you want to meet this Jesus, you say, I want to dedicate my life to this Jesus. Not the Jesus that I have to work for, but the Jesus that worked for me. Not the Jesus that I have to pay back, but the Jesus that canceled all my debt. If you want to meet this Jesus tonight, the Jesus of the gospel, not the Jesus of your grandma, not the Jesus of your dad or your tia or your tia, no, your Jesus tonight, the one that wants to remind you what he did, I'm going to invite you to meet him right here, right now. And if that's you, on the count of three, I want you to just lift a hand up in the air and say, I want to meet him right now. On the count of three, one, two, three. That's you tonight. You say, I want to meet this Jesus. Thank you so much. All over the building. Thank you so much. Thank you so much. As every person in this room repeats this prayer after me, I just want you to realize that you are now coming in contact with God's perfect love that is Jesus. So if you're here tonight, I want you to repeat this prayer. Say, dear God, thank you for your son, Jesus. I believe that he died for me. So tonight I want to live for him. I believe he hung on a tree so I don't have to hang in my situation anymore. I believe he rose again, so tonight I rise again. I'm saved in Jesus' name, amen.